I want to talk to you all today about production grade TypeScript. I've been dealing with TypeScript for quite a while. Uh, for five years, I was building up Prisma, where I was trying to make developers' lives better, working with databases with TypeScript. And currently, I'm on a new adventure to build a new kind of app, a new music app in a local first way. And while doing that, I'm also exploring a whole bunch of new technologies, such as effects. I'm exploring local first software and just really love the, so the, the craft of software engineering. Um, I'm in Berlin. If you're in Berlin, want to hang, uh, hit me up. Uh, but I want to take you a few years back when I was just taking a sabbatical from Prisma and was really keen to get my own hands dirty again, start working on actual code. And uh, this is what AI thinks of me working on a project. Uh, so the beginning was pretty cool. Lots of good progress, very, felt very productive. But it didn't, didn't take long for me approaching, trying to release an app in production. Uh, and things didn't go so well anymore. And I was really struggling with like, making that app ready for production. And I was thinking a lot about, OK, what does it even take to get apps ready for production, to make them production grade? So I want to walk you through a simple example that I'm sure most of you are, like, you've built thousands of that in your past. Uh, let's say we want to do a simple fetch call from a to-do's endpoint. I know, to-do apps are boring, but you get the idea. So we're fetching from an endpoint, then getting the response JSON, and then we're, we have the, da the data ready to use, right? Easy enough. What could go wrong? I've learned this code that we've just seen so far is just the tip of the iceberg of what we actually need to deal with. And what it really means to make an app production ready, this is, I think, what's rather submerged, submerged in the ice. Thank you. Um, so one first thing you got to do is take care of the errors that might happen. Uh, Murphy's Law, errors always happen. So, and for dealing with an HTTP endpoint, there's quite a lot of errors that could happen. So maybe our response returns correctly, but it is not a valid HTTP code, so we gotta throw, we gotta throw an error here. Or the response doesn't even, the, the request doesn't even go through properly, and the request has failed. Or there's an error while we think there is a JSON response, but it's just a text response, so we also gotta deal with that. And as we're doing all of like this try-catch dance here, we also notice that TypeScript doesn't quite has, a, has us covered here. So the error that we're catching here um, often just like infers to unknown or any, depending on your TypeScript settings. So that's not terribly useful. So a different way to, we still got to deal with that somehow, but a different way how we can model this that makes our lives somewhat nicer and somewhat easier is to at least return the errors as values. That's generally like a, a good practice. But now that we've, mo that we've improved our code by taking care of errors, uh, we've already added 13 additional lines of code just for the simple example. And that's just the beginning, since now we've somehow detected these errors, but we've got to do something about it. So another common way to deal with that is to retry when an error happens. And you don't want to just like retry immediately. You want to do so in a graceful way. Otherwise, you might end up DDoSing your own API. So here, we are implementing uh, like an exponential backoff to do the error retries. And um, yeah, that takes quite a bit of effort. Here, adding another 20 li 22 lines of code. And you already see. This, I don't expect you to be able to read the small text anymore. This is just to give you an idea for uh, yeah, how out of hand is, this is getting. But that's not all, since it might also very well be that the HTTP endpoint just hangs, and we don't want to let the user here wait forever. So here we want to just time out after a second. And to do that in a proper way, we got to respond to the timeout with an abort controller. But adding an abort controller to this entire thing also takes quite a bit of effort. So another 20 lines of code. And I'd like to know what's going on with my app as it's running. So I'd like to keep my code observable. 
So I'm often using open telemetry for that. But that also means wrapping your entire code again, instrumenting it in the happy path, in the error case, et cetera. So another 20 lines of code. And so with just in this simple example, we went from this, these seven lines of code that were really easy to understand to over 80 lines of code. So that's just like 10 x our entire code just to go from this happy path to, the, to just making it more production grade. I'm sure that uh, not many people go through such a great extent and they are rather keeping it at the seven lines of code and then things blow up in production. And I was really thinking a lot about that and I was puzzled, why is it so hard in TypeScript to build production grade app software? In other languages, this is actually a, quite a bit easier to, de to deal with those things. Proper error handling, retrying on error, interruption, making your code observable. And in this simple example, we haven't even yet looked at other common scenarios such as dealing with those things in a concurrent situation, maybe validating the response that you're, that you're getting back. So you might now argue, okay, a lot of those scenarios, um, there are NPM packages for that. And that's partially true, but I would argue that so many of those packages just feel so incoherent. They're all, like, for better or for worse, built by different people, which I think is a good thing, but they don't quite feel the same. They don't have really a good shared foundation. The API feels inconsistent, and often they also just uh, cover the happy path, don't quite well deal with error handling, and sometimes they're unmaintained. So I was really at this crossroads here where I felt, hmm, should I really stick with JavaScript? This is what I've done for the last 15 years at that point. But I was also, I had some experience with other languages in the past. Uh, I was also um, using Rust for quite a few projects. So, but I wanted to invest in a program language that really uh, has, that I can use as a foundation for the years and decades to come. And I think there's really just a few options right now. There might, there's JavaScript, but there's also Rust. Um, so I was exploring Rust more for my app development um, requirements, and I love the well-designed language. It's very ergonomic, it has a great standard library, but also it comes at a cost. It is, at the end of the day, a systems-level program language where you've got to take care of a lot of things, such as memory management, and that felt like overkill for my app development use cases. So I gave JavaScript another, ch uh, another chance. There's a saying, of always bet on JavaScript. And I think there's some truth to that. And the first time I really realized how powerful JavaScript can be is when I transitioned a lot of apps from jQuery to React. And React gave us a more constrained programming model, but through that it gave us some, com some principles and some abstractions such as components that made our, quotes, our, co our code composable, et cetera. And I think that really blew my mind and I was wondering, hmm, maybe there's a similar kind of set of abstractions that help me with the problems I was facing now, built using regular TypeScript, but maybe there's a better way to deal with that. And I guess you all know the answer, what we think could be that better path, otherwise you wouldn't be here. <laughs> so this is... <laughs> This is what I've, found, what I've discovered in 2020, and now four years later, we're here. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to fully go into the details what effect is, but uh, I'm curious, who was at the, the workshops yesterday? Nice. Oh, wow. wow, that's a lot of people. Who of you have like, wrote or uh, read the first line of effect code yesterday? Okay, oh, wow, that, that is great. I'm sure there will be many people watching this talk on YouTube uh, who are now disappointed that I'm not explaining to them what effect is. In a nutshell, it's a set of primitives that helps you to build your app and gives you an efficient runtime to run your app, very similar to how React gives you some abstractions and then ultimately helps you to run your app. But there are better ways to explain what effect is. I'm pointing you here to a great video, video by Ethan, who's, who's given a, a great demonstration of that and a great introduction. But I want to talk to you today about why I fell in love with effect and why I still love it every day. So 
starting with one point that I've introduced us with is Effect makes building production-grade TypeScript apps easy. It helps you with error handling, retries, interruption, all of those things that I would probably not bother to do otherwise if it wasn't easy. I follow this mantra of like make the right thing easy, and I think Effect really encapsulates that. But it doesn't just help you with that. It also has hands down the best developer experience once you're used to it in TypeScript. It comes in where TypeScript falls short, such as error handling and other scenarios. It gives you maximum type safety. You can look at a simple program, look at the type signature, and it tells you so much about the program, what it needs to run, what the result type is, what are the errors that can happen, and that is just incredibly useful when you're working on it. But by now, we also, I think, have a really nice intuitive API. We have inline docs. We have some good examples. And spoiler alert, we might make the developer experience even better. Uh, and you're going to hear more in the next talk. Effect also is a holistic standard library. And I think this is something we've been really missing in the JavaScript ecosystem for so long. This is what makes other programming languages so attractive, Golang, Rust, they all have a fantastic standard library. In JavaScript, we have, like, yeah, we have some standardization across the browser in Node, but we're still reaching for Lodash and like, all of those packages that yeah, they, they take you so far, but then we just combine all of those different packages and Effect can just replace all of those through a really solid foundation. So it has batteries included, super high quality, but you also just bundle in your app what you actually need. It's very bundle friendly, tree shakeable, and all of the other things that build on top of Effect are really elegantly layered. And this is what unlocks Effect's composability. I think a lot of developers are kind of always dreaming about, oh, my code should be more composable, but it's rarely achieved. I think React has achieved that with components, but many other technologies have not quite achieved that. And Effect has really blown my mind there, and I think you have to really try it and use it on a daily basis to fully appreciate what it means, how Effect makes code so composable. But this is the killer feature for me. And it forces uh, writing, writing homogeneous code that makes your code composable. It makes your code reusable across your own project or multiple projects or as open source project. And it helps you to make your, test, your app more testable. And this is what becomes the foundation of Effect's amazing and deep, rich ecosystem. The best way to appreciate how how Effect makes code composable is by revisiting our example from before and now written in Effect. You see the first two lines of the implementation of the get to do function here is where we are fetching the, the to do's endpoint and we want to say only uh, continue running this if the status code, if the HTTP code is 200. And then we're continuing to decode the JSON. So that's very similar to what we had before, except now what added before, like over 70 lines of code, we're now expressing in three lines of code. We want to say, hey, that thing should run in maximum of one second, otherwise time out. Then we're using an exponential backoff to retry in, in case of an error. And then we're also through a single line of code instrumenting our code and making it observable. And this is what my code looks like on a daily basis, and it's just a pleasure to read and write, and I don't think you get that anywhere else. And another great thing about JavaScript is that it runs everywhere, and so does Effect. Effect can be used to, to write web apps that run in the browser. You can write mobile apps that use, for example, something like React Native. You can build desktop apps with Electron or Tauri. You can run Effect on the server. You can run it on the edge. It runs everywhere. And it makes it much easier to truly build isomorphic apps, to build isomorphic, isomorphic JavaScript code, and makes it easy and safe to reuse and run your code across different platforms. No more little hacks needed like, oh, type of equals undefined. Oh, OK, this is where we, um, this is where we know we are in the browser or in a different context. And Effect 
makes that super easy by providing different platform packages for all different kinds of environments. Effect also scales. It helps you scale your app as you have more requirements, as complexity grows, and managing that complexity, keeping things simple. But it also scales with your team, whether you're just a single developer building a sophisticated app, or you're part of a giant engineering organization, and you have a massive code base that you're working on. And Effect is also able to run your code very efficiently and is able to scale to high load scenarios. For me, it's really important to know what the heck is going on with my app as it's running. So I'm reaching for observability here, specifically through open telemetry. And Effect supports that out of the box. I think this is something that's really underused and underappreciated in the web community. Other communities already use that a lot more, where you have things, for example, built in with Tokyo tracing and Rust, or open telemetry built in into like with really good Golang packages. In JavaScript, it's still really hard to use that, and Effect makes that incredibly easy. You get out of the box tracing, out of the box logging, out of the box metrics, and that's just incredibly nice to use and gives you a much better idea what is going on with your app instead of constantly reaching for console log. So it really just takes a single line of code to instrument your, your code, and uh, you get those beautiful traces and metrics just for free. And that's one aspect of what makes me confident about running my code, but Effect also gives me more confidence overall. It make, gives me confidence to refactor my code. Let's say I'm joining a new company. They have a pretty big code base. I'm not yet familiar with it. In a traditional setup, if you're asked to, to make some changes to it, I kind of get scared. Like, if I'm changing something, maybe I finally fix like, the type system errors, I'm running it, and everything blows up. Ugh, where, where should I even look at? What, what are the, the consequences of my little change here? Or maybe even worse, it doesn't blow up immediately, but it blows up in production. That's scary. And this is something where I want things to, I want to have this sort of feedback as quickly as possible. And given effect provides such an incredible level of type safety, type safety, you're getting that feedback immediately, and you can refactor and make changes with confidence and move super quickly. And it makes it fun. So that's a huge one for me. So all of those. This is just, again, kind of tip of the iceberg, why I love Effect. There's many more reasons, but just so much time to cover today. Um, so I want to go through where Effect is today. And there is a lot to talk about, but I'm proud to address one of the major pain points that we've been seeing for the last two years, really, that we didn't have any solid documentation. And that has changed. Julia has been knocking it out of the park by building some really solid documentations. We also have an incredible website now that uh, gives newcomers a better idea what Effect is about and makes them curious. Another huge milestone for us was that Julia, with the FPTS project, has officially joined Effect. So those projects have merged. Maybe some of you are here today because you've been using F FPTS in the past. And it's just incredible to work with Julia together, who is right now also moving the, the Effect Schema project forward a lot. And speaking of Effect Schema, we've released recently some new packages that I think are just as foundational as Effect itself. The Schema package, the RPC package that replaces something like TRPC platform packages that co cover all sorts of different platforms, the browser, Node, Bun, et cetera, Open Telemetry. We have a great CLI package. And so this just gives you a little idea of where things are going with the ecosystem. That makes me super excited. Just to give you a little idea of like how amazing everything is developing, we have a super active and passionate Discord community uh, where I'm sure we've already interacted in one way or another. We, the effect package is also going through the roof in terms of downloads on NPM. There are more and more open source packages that use effect. And we have a really nice velocity in terms of making progress on the project itself. We have amazing content by the community. And people are also excited on Twitter and uh, share with others what Effect is about. For me, 
also kind of the most important thing is the, the community of contributors where without that effect wouldn't exist. And I'm super excited to see that our community is growing more and more. We have more and more contributors who make really meaningful contributions to the project and the ecosystem overall. So a huge shout out to everyone here or not here. Thank you so much for, to all the contrib contributors. I'm also super excited to see Effect being used in production more and more, whether it's a foundation for next generation open source technologies or in enterprises such as Zendesk, Embedded Insurance, or MarkPrompt. MarkPrompt uh, is built by some friends of mine. They're currently doing Y Combinator and they're building some AI apps. And I want to hear from Mike how, from Michael, how it's going to use Effect for the first couple of months. Hi everyone. So Johannes has been bugging me for I think two years now uh, to start making the switch to Effect and we finally took the leap last month and all I can say is that I wish we had made the move earlier. At Mark Prompt, we are building AI infrastructure for customer support. We're working with enterprise customers and from day one our pillars are security, reliability and performance. Our problems range from synchronizing data between systems in an efficient way to serving streaming APIs, building observability and monitoring tools. Uh, as a startup, we also need to ship fast uh, and be very responsive to our users' feedback. Uh, with effect, um, for the first time really, I feel we can build on a solid foundation and ship features quickly without compromising on quality. Uh, so I'm super excited by the future effect. And it feels to me like the missing standard library of, of JavaScript and I can't wait to be using it more and gradually deploying it throughout all our applications. So. Yeah, I'm super excited by this. Um, and yeah, given they're currently in Y Combinator, this like really high paced, stressful environment, and they have such a great experience with Effect, I think that's a great testament to it. So I'm super excited about that. I want to close this out with some ideas, not really promises, but maybe rather my hopes and predictions where Effect is going and where this entire ecosystem is going. And uh, I want to remind you that we're all here, like we're innovators. There's like some ideas of how technology adoption can happen generally. There's a great book called Crossing the Chasm that sort of has that theory of everything starts with, with innovators and there come early adopters and then the major, the early majority starting to adopt technologies. For effect, we're all still here in the innovator camp. So you all have new superpowers. We're all at the start of something really foundational new, but it will take a longer time for the, for the mainstream adoption to kick, kick in. But let's see where we are in a, in a year from now. So I think effect will become even easier, both easier to understand, easier to use, and easier to adopt. We want to make it easier to understand by improve, constantly improving our docs, creating more examples, more learning resources, but also nicer and easier to use by constantly improving our APIs, simplifying it where possible, working on new dev tools, and maybe we might even see some improvements in TypeScript itself that make effect, again, easier to use. And we also want to make it easier to adopt for newcomers by providing starter kits and AI is moving so quickly, maybe that also can help with adopting AI, uh, adopting effect into existing code bases. What I'm most excited about by far is the ecosystem that we're going to see. I think effect will go anywhere where JavaScript is running. We want to help make that better by continu continuously improving our standard library, adding first, new first class modules for more data structures, for example, a graph theory, graph theory library, but also by providing more API and library wrappers for existing services, whether it's the GitHub API, OpenAI API, AWS, and so on. But, and by also providing deeper integrations into existing frameworks and technologies, whether it's Next.js, OpenAPI, Terraform, and so on. And this is where all of you, hopefully, can also contribute. Maybe we might even see some more effect-centric meta frameworks. Think something like Next.js 
but built around effect from the core with like some really effect native APIs. And I'm also super excited that we might see more and more effect specific dev tools that appreciate and embrace the abstractions that effect provides similar to the react dev tools, but think about something like that for effect. And I think effect will go even higher level. Right now, effect is mostly used to build like your individual TypeScript apps, and it's helping a lot for that. That's why I reached for it in the first place. But I think we could see effect even be used for, for like more high level problems, for even distributed systems problems, where you want to build fault to tolerant distributed systems. Whether it's for smaller use cases like RPC endpoints or even microservices, for actor systems like clustering workflows where you right now rather reach for something like Elixir or the Erlang VM in the past, you might have also used Akka, or even for modern approaches such as durable workflows where there are technologies such as Temporal or Ingest, something that we could do more natively, directly in effect. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I think we'll see the best apps and the best tools be built on top of Effect. I think we all know that Effect is our new secret sauce to build the best software. And I think more and more apps will, will figure this out as well. I want to invite all of you to keep building. It's time to build. Please provide us feedback. If you need help, ask for help. This, was, this is what makes our community so awesome that we help each other. Uh, learn effects and, and share our, our insights with each other. Build apps, create examples, help each other, and share your story maybe next year. Thank you so much again to everyone involved. All right.